woodcraft, helping you make wood work. And one step that I've already forgotten is that if you have a gouge and you sharpen the beveled side first, rock it up until the leading edge is just, edge is just touching this flat stone and then you need to touch up the inside. So here's a slip stone and it has an arced, arced side on the top and a real narrow arc side on the bottom for really small gouges. And you can take and keep that inside edge sharp as well. And then after that step, go to the strop and give you a real nice fine edge. And one, uh, well, I guess I've already mentioned it, but when you do have a carving, always leave yourself a handle. Don't try to just carve the, pro the project so that your hand is so close. Keep, give yourself a nice handle that's far away to keep yourself safe. So is there any other uh, questions about safety? And then as a bidding, beginning wood carver, I would suggest one of three different types of wood. And this is Tupelo. And this is what uh, wood carvers that, uh, they carve ducks that, if they're f you're five feet away from these ducks, you can't even tell whether it's alive or not. They do such a great job carving Tupelo. It paints real well, you know, it just carves really nice. And once in a while you get a hold of a piece of Tupelo that it just, it, it doesn't carve quite right, and I think my theory is that it's grown, it's grown extremely fast, and maybe the summer rings are extremely soft, so therefore when you go to carve it, it the grain kind of crushes over or tears. What I would suggest is that before purchasing a piece of Tupelo, you, get, you bring a nice sharp knife with you, and just slice the end grain and see whether or not it cuts real clean or it tears before you purchase a piece of Tupelo. The drawback to Tupelo is that it's got kind of a boring grain, so if you want to put a clear finish on it, uh, you know, it's great for painting, but I wouldn't want, it's just kind of boring to me. In addition, there's basswood. It makes a great first project. It's soft, and you can put a lot of detail in it without it falling apart. And it has the same drawback as Tupelo in that the, bo the grain looks kind of boring to me. And, uh, but you can paint it. I see a beautiful fish right here that I expect was probably made from Tupelo, I don't know. Uh, but if you paint something, either of those two choices are great as a first carving. And then the third choice that I prefer is butternut because it's got it's related to walnut. It's not nearly as hard as black walnut. And it carves real nice as well. But when you're done, it has a very nice looking grain. And I prefer the looks of grain, the grain of the wood as opposed to painting. Uh, this, it may be hard to tell. I'm gonna, I have a picture right here of what this is supposed to look like when finished. I, I'm afraid that my present carving here just isn't very far along. This is what I'd like this to come out looking like when it's finished. So maybe you can better envision what I would like that to look like when done. Butternut. I, I got this online four by four, four, four inch by four inch one foot long and uh, I just think it works great. Frequently butternut will have worm holes in it and you do want to carve around those worm holes. But there's a fabulous wood carver named Fred Coglow and he paints or rather he carves uh, a full bust, life-size bust of people and frequently he'll leave those worm holes in there and, and he'll actually use them to his advantage and they look kind of cool when he's done. I don't know if you've ever seen his work. As a last, my last topic, uh, I'd like to talk about what it means to carve with the grain. And you always, whenever possible, sometimes you can't, but whenever possible, you want to carve with the grain 
of a piece of wood and it will become fairly evident to you after your carving uh, why that is so and the reason that you want to carve with the grain is because first of all it gives you a nice clean cut it's safer because there's less chance of the blade skipping out and into your hand and it and if you don't frequently it's going to chip down and into the work that you're trying to carve as opposed to just taking off the small amount of wood where you want it that you want to take off and I'd made uh, a small I'd started a small oval picture frame that I'd hoped to bring with me but I managed to leave it on my coffee table at home but the, this, this particular oval shape uh, I'd drawn arrows on it showing you that which way is carving with the grain in each aspect of the f this frame and which isn't and I uh, it's a, it would have been a good example for anyone to go ahead and try to carve on and try to carve both with and against the grain and see what I mean by carving with the grain and in my opinion this whatever level of carving I've reached so far it's just a uh, it's just continuing to refine my ability to carve with the grain and it doesn't matter if I have a, a large project and I'm striking this with a mallet or I'm have a really small project and I have a gouge this size and I'm trying to refine the the little nostril in a frog or something if you carve with the grain things are going to go much better and at, at that point I'm out of I'm out of material but I'd love to ha hear any questions yes Nick okay we're well, relief carving is where you would take maybe a flat board in this picture I was describing this picture frame is where you have a flat side and it would typically hang on a wall and uh, so it's just a, a relief and it's as viewed it's one dimensional has w a single side chip carving is also frequently done with a flat board and you lay out a nice geometric pattern say uh, you made a oh a nice jewelry box and you wanted the lid to have a nice uh, flower flower pattern in it so you lay out a very clean uh, exacting drawn image of what you'd like it to be but it's all straight lines there there's frequently n no no cur curved line in chip carving and what would you use is a chip carving knife here's here's a micro or a very small one uh, you might want to get a slightly larger one than this and it's basically a whole, a whole lot of triangles where you do a, a center cut and then you which would be right down the center of any of these triangles that you're carving and then you carve out the exact uh, image that you've drawn on there and uh, they're beautiful I've, I've seen chip carvings they're just fabulous and then carving in the round which is what I've done here is where you take something and you, you have a complete round image and it there's frequently few straight lines in it and it's all just rounded surfaces yes so this is this is some maple on a bay on the base in a cherry mouse and I brought this as an example of the mouse but also of what not to do because while you while if you if you carve with the grain like I said you can get a lot of detail and you can make something really intricate and delicate for example this leaf used to have a stem and it set about like this and he was looking up at this leaf with this stem that was about a quarter inch in diameter at its thinnest and of course that got bumped and broke off and it kind of broke my heart when that happened so while you can carve in uh, quite delicate items uh, if you remember to carve with the grain 
there's a good chance that eventually it's going to get broken. So why not just carve something that's just a little more robust as opposed to something as delicate as this leaf suspended over this mouse. So this, uh, this is a cherry base that, I've, that I turned on a lathe. And then I inserted this piece of, uh, rather, a, this is a maple base, and I, I inserted this cherry mouse into the top after he was carved. And it's interesting how things evolve, because I did start out with this piece of cherry, and I started to carve a leaf, period. I didn't plan to carve a mouse. And then you just keep looking at things, and they kind of evolve in your mind, and I work my way down, and this is, this is what came out of it eventually. Yeah, the, the cherry portion yeah. was all one piece, yeah. And in fact, I have a little uh, circle in here that's got some felt down in the bottom of it. And I purchased uh, a glass dome that fit right over the top of this. But it got broke anyway. <laughs> this is a Paduke. That's an exotic wood from South America. And it's quite beautiful and red until it sets in the sun, sunlight a while. And then Paduke has a habit of changing color. But there's, this is a Triceratops emerging from the egg. Uh, and I think it's, it's pronounced Tagua nut is what the horns are made of. And uh, I have a, a red cedar uh, uh, Triceratops at home. but but he's about this big and he has ash horns. Um, in the past I've carved alder. I carved a, a seven foot long dolphin, which uh, a gentleman put on the side of his house near Seattle that he commissioned me to carve. Okay, well I guess that, that concludes the demonstration. I'd like everyone to feel free to come up and, and carve on some wood if you feel like it.